So thank you for a more than generous introduction. You know, one of the pleasures of growing old, <laughs> probably the only pleasure, is that uh, wherever you Five go in... younger than me. <laughs> I'll still maintain what I'm saying, the only pleasure, uh, is that wherever you go in this world, you have friends. I think you'll agree with that, you know, that you know people all over the world. So every place feels like home. So even though the first time I'm coming to this campus, I know many people, so good feeling. And thank you very much for hospitality, and uh, it's a pleasure. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges of uh, cyber-physical systems. And uh, the first question is, what on earth are cyber-physical systems? And uh, there are many ways to approach it. So I want to give you a broad uh, perspective. How, what is this field? Where is it coming from? Etc. So one path, and, with, and this actually is the path which led to the evolution of this name, okay, is from real-time and hybrid systems. So computers were developed for computation around 1949. But something very interesting happened in uh, 1973. Uh, Real-time computation, there was this uh, seminal paper by uh, Lou and Leyland uh, that was written and that created a lot of, uh, created the field of real-time systems, I think. And uh, what is very interesting about that is that if all you wanted to do was computation, then the only thing that matters is the order in which you do things. If you do A before B before C before D, you'll get the right answer. So the only reason why people were interested in real time was because they were thinking of the physical world. Because only the physical world knows what time it is, right? So already people were thinking of somehow computers interfacing with the physical world and not just for calculation, okay? Then in the same spirit, there's a lot of work in hybrid systems which are the interplay of uh, uh, different Newtonian differential equations describing the physical world and uh, logical dynamics of uh, computers, okay? And around uh, 2006, there's a whole bunch of people in the US uh, plotting how to extract more money from the National Science Foundation, <laughs> which is a permanent uh, occupation of uh, many academics. And, uh, they created this phrase, cyber-physical systems, and it found enormous traction, not just in the US, but uh, all over the world, and there are many centers uh, everywhere. And uh, somehow it uh, captured, uh, captured the moment uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, not only the evolution of computers, but also many other fields, which I will get to. Okay. So, uh, one way to think of this, uh, uh, this area is as the third generation of uh, control systems. So in the modern uh, uh, electronic uh, era, uh, the first generation of control systems was based on uh, operational amplifiers, right? And uh, basically analog control. And that, to use the operational amplifier, actually needed a theory, and it was a very painfully developed theory at Bell Labs <coughs> uh, due to the work of uh, Bode and uh, Nyquist and so on. And the right tool was uh, frequency domain analysis. Okay. Then around 1960, uh, the field of digital control was born. And this, of course, the technology was digital computation. And that required also a theory in order to use the platform. And the platform, and the theory was not frequency domain analysis, it was more state space design. That was more natural for uh, discrete computational devices. Uh, and on the computer science side, it was supported by the emergence of the field of real time scheduling. So, this uh, field, which was born in 1960 uh, till about 2000 and continuing, uh, did a very uh, uh, I mean, thorough exploration of the field of systems, okay? And uh, many wonderful books were uh, written on all these topics, and each of these is not just uh, an adjective. There's a, each of these books is very painful to read in terms of definitions and theorems and things like that. A very thorough uh, exploration of uh, optimality and uh, uh, nonlinearity and adaptation and robustness and stability and things like that. Okay, a rich bouquet of books. But it's still about 50 years old, and in the intervening 50 years, things have changed. Uh, long time ago, there were no embedded computers. 
Now embedded computers are uh, 98 plus percent of all computers and essentially going as a fraction to 100 percent, okay. Uh, we didn't have wireless and wireline networking and there have been tremendous advances in software engineering also. So all these uh, three things are actually giving rise to another platform revolution. Just like we had a platform revolution when we went from operational amplifier to digital control, so also we may be on the cusp of a platform revolution. Okay? And I think that this is uh, uh, just in time uh, for the system building era of the 21st century. So I think the 21st century will be uh, the age of large scale system build building. As we become more aware of uh, uh, the resource limitations of this planet, okay? And at the same time, increasing demand from huge segments of the globe which uh, didn't have the vocal demands that they have nowadays for transportation or energy or water or uh, medical services or whatever. I think all of these things will have to be met by building systems that cater to the needs in a frugal way, okay? So, and I think this uh, whole field of cyber physical systems, many of the technologies are very uh, critical for all these future systems, okay? So it's just in time to save this planet from ourselves, essentially. So that's one path. Another way to think about this is from the communication side. Uh, so we are very much in the era of uh, cellular systems. There are many countries like India, China, which are adding like 10 million cell phone lines a month, okay? And uh, it's gone down a little bit, but it was in that order. It was even more, actually. Uh, and we may be on the cusp of a wireless revolution. Certainly Wi-Fi has uh, proliferated in all hotels and uh, universities and so on. And uh, now, with, with networking, all you can do is uh, talk to the other person or look at the other person's web page. Uh, but once you start plugging in your sensor, you can also find out what's happening in the physical world. And these are the first generation uh, moats that came out of Berkeley. You can connect your favorite sensor here, a light or heat or magnetic or whatever. And uh, these things also can do wireless uh, communication and computation. So the idea is to create sensor networks. But we all know that uh, sensing is only one half the story. The moment you sense something, you want to change it, okay, for the better. I'm not just interested in knowing the temperature in this room, I want to change it to my comfort, okay? So we can start closing the loop and that leads to the convergence of communication, computation and control. So all these trends are somehow coming together, uh, connecting the cyber and the physical world and that's what this uh, phrase actually captured and that's what attracted a lot of attention. Okay, in a sense though, this is actually the reconvergence of these fields. It's very interesting because uh, all these fields were actually born out of the same cauldron uh, in the middle of the 20th century, okay? There is a very nice book by David Mindell who's a professor of the history of technology at MIT and uh, it's a beautiful uh, account of, uh, detailed account of all that, you know, there were conversations between control, communication. In fact, these fields were not really separated, you know. The same people worked in many of these things. But what happened is after about 1950, 1960, uh, all these uh, fields uh, became separate pillars, okay, kind of uh, growing on their own. And I guess in some sense that was necessary because there was a lot of uh, uh, agenda, unfinished agenda in each of these pillars, okay. But since about 2000, uh, all, the, all these fields are coming together. Okay, it's very hard now to separate communication from computation and, and so on. Uh, so we, are, we now have nodes that can communicate, control, compute, and so this is again leading back to unification of all these fields. Okay? And that of course has major pedagogical uh, as well as research challenges and so on. Okay, so uh, uh, last year was uh, the centenary of IEEE interpreted in the sense that IEEE was formed after the fusion of AIE and uh, uh, IRE. What, IRE, right? And uh, the proceedings actually had a centennial issue. And uh, among the 19 topics they chose, the alphabetically, uh, the first was cyber physical systems. So they had a, an article on uh, each of these things. So if you go back and look at your uh, proceedings, you'll find, uh, find uh, an article on that. 
Okay, I will skip this. There are many, many issues, okay, that one can talk about in this field. Uh, in fact, I was at a recent panel in Italy where somebody asked uh, us to give an example of something that's not a cyber physical system, and we couldn't come up with anything. So, almost everything is, and in fact, that's one of the good things about this phrase is that you can do pretty much what you want, and uh, funding agencies are happy with it, okay? So, there are many, many uh, issues, okay? I'm saying this in a light way, but, but uh, issue of delay guarantees. In fact, time is a, uh, an important thing that connects the cyber and the physical world, okay? Then in many time, in many contexts, uh, delay guarantees, for example. Uh, also verification, validation, timeliness of interactions, many, many uh, things. Uh, how to e extract information, not data, from a network. Uh, what are the appropriate abstractions? Uh, how can we guarantee systems to perform correctly? So many, many questions, and I'm going to touch upon uh, all these things. Uh, but I do want to spend a slide talking about how to, uh, what is the problem, <laughs> okay. So this area is, uh, intersects many, many areas, right? And uh, there are problems in each of these intersections. I'm just going to give you a few vignettes uh, here and there. Okay, the first uh, topic I want to talk about is delivering packets on time. Okay, and uh, one of the reasons I am talking about it is I know that uh, there are many people here who are experts in uh, real-time systems. Uh, so I wanted to share some work that we've done. <coughs> and this is done with uh, Yi Hong Hao, who was my PhD student and is now my colleague uh, at Texas A&M. <coughs> okay, so uh, uh, you know the current internet, uh, it doesn't give you really any guarantees, okay? It's what is called best effort. But best effort doesn't mean anything. <laughs> best effort simply means I tried and I failed and I'm sorry. Uh, it's certainly not best. Uh, and even when they do talk of some quantities, it will be throughput, which also, which also you should take with a grain of salt. When your cable company comes and says you'll get 12 megabits per second, it may be 12, it may be one, you know. It's a notional figure at best. Uh, but certainly, they never talk of uh, delays. But yet, uh, you know, we are more and more getting interactive traffic and closing loops on cyber physical systems, and delay becomes more and more important. Okay? So, fundamental question how do you support delay guarantees over an unreliable medium like wireless? So, here's a problem to keep at the back of your mind a motivational problem. Okay? Your modern automobile has uh, about 75 sensors and about 100 switches. And they're connected by wiring of the order of one kilometer. Okay? And this is the way the wiring harness is made. It's uh, extremely costly. It's uh, comp very heavy. It's very complicated. And uh, these are the failures that occur in any mechanical harness, okay? So what people want to do is replace that wiring harness, put a base station in a car, okay? Uh, with savings on all those topics that I talked about. But, and this is not just a fictional thing, this is actually, there are groups working on these problems. And one of the, and actually they are pretty co confident about the physical uh, communication capability, okay? It's low bitrate impulse radio. Uh, but what you really want is uh, how to give guarantees for all the loops that are being closed. There are so many loops being closed and every one of them has, needs to be uh, communicate packets on time, otherwise you won't have uh, predictability of your car, right? So. Uh, how do you guarantee that? Okay, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so let me go back to the field of real-time scheduling. Okay, not all of you may be experts. Some of you are, certainly, uh, to 1973. So here is the simplest uh, model, a very, uh, very elegant and actually a powerful and uh, influential model. Uh, so you have the, this is for uh, real-time computation. So you have this notion of task, okay? And there are many tasks, capital N tasks. And each task is a sequence of jobs, 
Okay, so this entire sequence is one task, and there are capital N of these tasks. Okay, and uh, in this simple model, these jobs arrive periodically, and the time between arrivals is tau n, and so that's the period. And for each computational job that comes in, there is a hard deadline, and the deadline is the end of the period. So this job that comes in here, you want it done, completed by this time. Okay, and uh, Typically what they do is they'll profile the jobs, come up with a worst case execution time, maybe have a non-deterministic, uh, as, as far deterministic an operating system as possible and so on. But ultimately profile these things. So if this is the worst case computation time and you begin the computation here, you complete it here. So in this particular trace that I've shown you, this first job was certainly completed before its deadline. The second one was, but the third one was not for some reason. And then we'll say it's a deadline miss. Okay, and in the field of hard real-time computation, you want absolutely no deadline misses. And that's a goal that they can actually achieve in a deterministic environment, okay? Uh, and also, uh, Lou and Leyland came up with this very simple policy called rate monotone scheduling. And uh, basically, it gives priority to jobs that occur more, that arrive more frequently. It's a static priority policy. And they guaranteed that uh, if the CPU loading is less than a certain number, about 70%, then you're guaranteed that you can meet all the jobs, complete all the jobs in time, irrespective of task phase, how their, how their arrivals are shifted with respect to each other. And in some sense, it's also maximum, okay? So very simple policy, very nice uh, result. And actually, this is the bedrock of real-time uh, computation. Now, what we'd like to do take that as an inspiration to come up with something like that for wireless communication to get this field off the ground, okay? But there's a big challenge because now the medium is unreliable and how can you give guarantees in an unreliable environment? And also we want to, we want to come up with something that is simple, that's usable with simple policies, okay? And I'll show you something uh, for which we can get nice results uh, which are extensible and in some cases surprising. So it's an interesting area. <coughs> so here's the problem. There's an access point, and this access point is serving capital M clients. And so think of this as your car, okay, base station in a car. And uh, we'll assume the channels are unreliable. So just for simplicity, we can generalize this, but take a very simple model of unreliability. Let us suppose that every day the access point can send a packet to some one person, today to this person, tomorrow to that person, and so on. And uh, when the access point sends a packet to client two, uh, it may or may not get there. Uh, P2 is a probability that it'll get there. So it's a simple Bernoulli reliability model. You can get more sophisticated. Okay, so, and these reliabilities may change depending on whom you're talking to. So they're unreliable channels, heterogeneous. Uh, time is slotted, packet, every packet fits within a slot, okay? And we'll take the same kind of Lou Leyland model where packets arrive periodically, okay, with a certain period. And there's a deadline, so a packet that comes in here should be delivered to the client by a certain time, okay? And uh, for example, in this trace, this packet was delivered, this was delivered, but this was not, it was dropped. If a packet is not delivered by its deadline, it's dropped, okay? Now, why was the packet dropped? Well, many reasons. Perhaps you tried sending it many, many times, but you're unlucky, the channel was unreliable. Or it could be that you didn't try it, you were trying something else. But whatever it is, it's possible that no matter what you do, some packets will get dropped, okay? So, let us suppose that in this particular trace, uh, out of three periods that I'm showing you for this particular client, uh, in two of those periods you delivered a packet, in the third period you did not deliver the packet. So let us say that the throughput of packets in this, for this client is two thirds, two out of three. But this is not just ordinary throughput. This is the throughput of packets which respect a hard deadline. Okay, so let's call it a timely throughput. Now suppose, Every client requests a certain timely throughput. So the little nth client says, I want QN packets per period on average. Everyone demands a timely throughput. Now we have a simple question. Given the timely throughput requirements of each client, given the reliabilities of each client, and given the rate at which they arrive, 
Can the access point support these clients? Yes or no? It's a binary question. Now, okay. So what I'm suggesting here is a contract. A contract between the access point and the clients. Each client says, this is how unreliable I, my channel is. This is what I want. This is how often I come. Can you support me or not? Okay. And the, now, the value of a contract, see contracts in order to be useful have to have two characteristics. First, they should be useful, right? So the application said, should say this is a useful contract, right? So if the application do, can describe its service or something in terms of these parameters, then it's useful, okay? The second part of a contract is that it should be possible to satisfy the contract, to meet the contract, right? So in other words, the access point should have some way of telling whether it can satisfy the contract and also how to satisfy it, how to schedule things. And what I'm going to show you is that we can come up with very elegant answers and many extensions of this. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is we're operating, we're creating a theory uh, across many time scales. So at the shortest time scale, you have the notion of slots and you have the notion of slot level reliability. Then you have a more medium term notion of uh, arrivals and deadlines, okay? And then you have a long term notion of uh, throughput, number of packets per period over the long haul. Okay, I'm going to skip this uh, details. Okay, I'm going to actually take you through a little bit of theory, okay? Because uh, it's actually followable by everybody and it's interesting. Hopefully. So let's work out the theory. Now, the, the load in, in, uh, imposed by each client is WN, okay? How much percentage of the access point's attention is needed by a client? That's WN, okay? So if WN is 0.2, that means uh, the, this client requires 20% of the access point's attention to satisfy it. How do you calculate it? Very simply. Uh, QN packets arrive per period. I'm uh, sorry, have to be delivered per period. Each delivery takes one over PN slots. Why is that? If PN is half, that means the channel is 50% reliable, I have to make two attempts to get a packet through. If PN is one third, I have to make three attempts to get the packet through, right, on average. So one over PN is the number of attempts to get a packet. So, and then, so QN over tau is the number of packets needed per slot. And each one of them requires one over PN slots. So this is the slots per slot needed by the nth client. So this is the percentage of the access point's attention that that client would require just to satisfy it. So clearly the total utilization has to be less than one. And if you need more than 100% of the service time, then it's clearly impossible. So this is a necessary condition, right? Is it sufficient? It turns out it's not, because something new comes up when you have deadlines, which is not there in queuing theory. And the reason is, there is uh, unavoidable idleness. So, so let's take this very simple uh, access point with two clients, and let us say the period is three. Now, notice that at any given time, the system can have at most two packets in it. A packet comes in, any other packets that came earlier were either delivered or dropped. So during this period, at most there can be one packet from this client, and during this period there can be at most one packet from this client. So you cannot have more than two packets, ever. There's no queuing, okay? Now, let us suppose that you try this packet in the first slot, and it's successful, it's gone. Now there are no more packets of this client. Then you try, let us say, this slot, and this packet is also successful, then it's gone. Now the third slot, there's no more packets, you have to be idle. You don't want to be idle, you want to use up, your, make, utilize the server's time, but there's no packets. So there is some unavoidable idleness. So you cannot remain busy 100% of the time. There's a certain fraction of lost time. How much lost? That's easy to calculate. Uh, so let this be the unavoidable idleness when there are capital N packets. The nest is strong, I'll, I'll show you how to calculate it. But basically the total utilization plus this unavoidable idleness should be less than 100%. How do you calculate that? That's easy. Uh, the time required for the nth client is random. It's in fact geometrically distributed with a certain parameter. This is the total time required to satisfy all the clients. And if that is less than the period, then the positive remaining part 
is idle time. The expected value is the number of idle slots divided by tau is the percentage of idle time. So this plus that should be less than one. Clearly necessary, right? Is it sufficient? And here's where it becomes interesting. It is not sufficient. You need to go dig a little bit deeper. And I'm going to show you an example. Let's take the same system where you have two clients, three periods. And as I said, you could have one unavoidable idle slot, right? So let's calculate for this. Let us suppose that period is three, as here. The client one's channel is 50% reliable. Client channel two also is 50% reliable. Both these channels are 50% reliable. Ch client one requires 0.876 packets per period. And client two requires 0.45 packets per period. Can the access point satisfy them? Okay. So I calculate the utilization due to client one. It is this. That's less than one. So that's good. I calculate the utilization due to client two. That's less than one. That's good. Total utilization of both these put together is also less than one. Looks good. But you also need to calculate idle time. Well, in this particular case, if you're successful on the first slot and then successful on the second slot, then you get one out of three slots idle. So this is the unavoidable idleness. Then you add up this plus this, and that's also less than one, so it looks good. So you think you're okay, but not really. Let's do one thing. Let's throw away client two. Forget client two. You don't even have to serve client two. All you have is one client. Can you make that client happy? Okay. Well, this is the utilization due to client one. Good. It's less than one. But now, because I dropped a client, the idle time increases. There's less people to keep me busy. How much did it increase? Well, if you're successful on the first slot, you have two idle slots. If you fail on the first slot and are successful on the second slot, you have one idle slot. So this is the idle time. And if you add up these two, it's larger than one. So it's not possible. So you can't even make client one alone happy. So this is not possible. So go back to the drawing board, come up with an even stronger necessary condition. Clearly, every subset of client should be feasible, not just the, in entirety. And you can write down the idle, unavoidable idle time if there's a certain subset. And how do you do that? Uh, let's see, that's the way you'd, uh, I'm not, I don't have an expression, but basically add up the uh, service times, compare it to tau, take the surplus, and that's idle time. Now, the reason why I need to look at all subsets is because the utilization increases with subsets. As I give you more work to do, your utilization has to increase, but the amount of uh, idle time decreases. So the total of this is not monotone increasing in, in uh, subsets. So that's why you have to check all subsets. Okay, not enough to evaluate the whole set. But anyway, this is, turns out it's clearly necessary, but we can also show it's sufficient. In fact, it's exact characterization of what an access point can do in terms of timely delivery of packets, QoS problem, okay? So necessary and sufficient. So complete characterization, okay? Uh, now this is, uh, by the way, this looks like an exponential test. It can be done in linear time. There's also a very simple policy which I'm not going to describe, but basically, uh, we can characterize with more precision what clients with timely requirements can be supported. Okay, I'm going to skip this uh, in the interest of time. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can do more general channel models, rate adaptation. Uh, you can do elastic traffic, utility maximization, strategic behavior of clients, uh, broadcasting when you don't get acknowledgements, many, many things, okay? All right, let me move on to uh, another topic. Uh, how do we in, uh, extract uh, information from networks, not data? Okay, so, uh, so imagine that you have these sensor networks that I talked about, and you have a whole bunch of, say, temperature sensors monitoring some domain, and uh, let us say there are n of these nodes, and let us suppose that every one, one of them takes uh, temperature, so X1 is a temperature collected by this one, X2 by this one, and so on. So there's N of them. And let us suppose that there is some uh, base station or uh, gateway or uh, uh, fusion node or something <coughs> which, uh, which wants to know the average temperature. 
So this uh, fusion node wants to do fusion of sensor uh, data, but it's not interested in all the individual temperatures. It only wants to know the average. Okay, or if you have a fire alarm network, maybe the fusion node only wants to know the maximum temperature. Is the maximum temperature more than 100 degrees, okay? So the amount of, or it may, could even be even less. Maybe it doesn't even want to know the av maximum temperature. It only wants to know whether the maximum temperature is more than uh, uh, Fahrenheit, what, 458 or whatever the, <laughs> some burning point of paper or something. So it only wants to know one bit of information. Is the temperature larger than this or smaller than this? So there's a lot of data, but one bit of information. How should a network uh, deliver that information? How should it gather it? How should it uh, compute it? So, so sensor networks are not the same as data networks, where you simply replace files by sensors. And the reason is the following. In a data network, you never look inside a packet. I only look at the header. I don't say your packet is a very boring email and drop it. But you may, in a sensor network, you could say there's a low temperature reading, I'm only interested in high temperature, so I drop it, okay? So, so basically, these uh, nodes can drop packets. They can also create packets. They can fuse packets. They can synthesize packets. So basically, each node here is not just a dumb forwarder. It's actually a computational device. So what we're talking of here is a fabric of computational devices interconnected by wireless network, getting sensory data, and extracting information. And question, what we want to understand is how to process information in a network. How should networks process information? Okay, uh, I'm, going to, I'm just going to give you a hint of uh, some questions and some results. Uh, show you that there are interesting possibilities here. So let me just show you that uh, determining the mean temperature is a very different problem from determining the max temperature. It turns out that the maximum rate at which the mean can be calculated is 1 over log n. This is the rate at which mean temperatures can be exfiltrated out of a network with n nodes. Okay? Uh, and the architecture for that is the standard architecture that each of you would come up with. So you, you have your domain, you have a whole bunch of nodes, there's a fusion node somewhere. You tessellate the domain into small pieces, and in each piece you'd add up the temperatures. By the way, the mean temperature is the same as total temperature. Okay? So you just add up, and then you'd form an in-tree rooted at the fusion node, and you'd propagate these uh, totals. And it turns out that all the load balancing is done in a cell at the fusion point. Everything is beautifully balanced when you're operating at this maximum rate, okay? On the other hand, to calculate the max, you can get an exponential speed up. And what is very interesting is that uh, this strategy for computing the mean doesn't make use of the most fundamental idea of Shannon, <laughs> one of the most fundamental ideas of Shannon, which is block coding. So it is, uh, see, what is what Shannon said, don't send bit by bit, take 1,000 bits, and send them 1,000 at a time, and you can get eff efficient advantages. It's called channel coding, right? Uh, here, it turns out that uh, block coding doesn't buy you anything except a multiplicative constant. However, block coding plays a fantastic role and gives you exponential speed up for the max. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, if you collect a whole bunch of temperatures, uh, you can announce this list, somebody else can fill in some gaps and so on, and basically you can very efficiently uh, communicate with each other. Okay, I don't want to get into the details. So basically you can uh, try to create a theory of complexity uh, which talks about uh, means and max and different sorts of networks and creates uh, some hierarchy. Okay? But this is very much at, uh, in an infancy, there's a lot more work to be done. Okay, the next topic, and I have for 20 minutes, okay. <clears throat> so, I want to talk of abstractions in architecture. I want to move upscale, okay? Uh, so, I claim that the success of the internet is primarily uh, architectural and only secondarily algorithmic, even though algorithms like TCP and so on have been important. And what do I mean by that? So, you take this uh, 
this is the nominal seven layer hierarchy. Uh, with it, it has this notion of peer to peer plus it has hierarchy, okay? Uh, now if you are a modulation expert, you can work at this layer. If you are a graph theorist working on routing, you can work at this layer uh, and so on. So what this does is it allows a, a specialization. Depending on what, you need to know only one thing and you can work on something. But it also, uh, so separation of concerns, if you will. But also it gives you plug and play. So for example, over the course of time, you have different ideas for TCP. Reno, New Reno, Vegas, whatever, different TCP protocols. And all you need to do is just replace that sliver. You don't need to replace the whole thing. Now, just to give you a, a sense of why this is important, consider the field of wireless networks, where there have, there's, there's a lot of attention on what is called cross-layer design. So what is cross-layer design? So somebody says, hey, wait, if I expose TCP parameters to the MAC layer, maybe I'll get a 20% improvement. But then somebody else may say, wait, if I, improve MAC, if I expose MAC parameters to TCP, maybe I'll get 25% improvement. <laughs> now, which will you choose? Well, if you choose, if you start uh, uh, making choices, then at the end of the day, you won't have any separation of concern. You'll just get a ball of spaghetti, okay? And that, after that, it cannot admit any more improvements. <laughs> okay, so you'll be frozen. You'll get one fast thing, but uh, not improvable, not maintainable, not debuggable, etc. right? You'll stop the evolution of the field. So, so there is a, but on the other hand, maintaining the stability of this architecture over decades has allowed it to proliferate. That proliferation has reduced per unit deployment cost, which is also performance. So in the face of it, you know, that looks, it looks like there's a tension between architecture and performance because the performance guys always want to bust the architecture. But if you look closely, architecture is also performance, but over the longer haul, okay? Anyway, so I, so I claim that architecture is important for proliferation of technology. Another example which I like very much is uh, this notion of uh, separation of hardware and software, the von Neumann bridge in instruction set architecture, uh, which uh, the term used by Valiant, von Neumann bridge. And basically, Intel and Microsoft don't need to know what each other are doing, but as long as they conform to an abstraction of the other side, then things will by and large interoperate. Okay? Now one of, and that's uh, re responsible essentially for the proliferation of serial computation. By the way, for parallel computation, we don't have a one Neumann bridge. <laughs> so in the 80s, we were, there was thinking machines. In 2010 or whatever we are now, it's, we still have a, uh, the same problems, multi-core and so on, okay? So the fundamental problems are difficult when you have, uh, when you lose this uh, bridge. Uh, and. Uh, there's also the source channel coding separation in communication theory and so on. So now we have these complicated systems where you have communication, computation, uh, fusion, everything going on. Question, what are the appropriate abstractions for this? Okay. Now what I don't want, what I'm not looking for is just a way to speed that up by 10% or 20%. That's not what I'm interested in. I want to cut the design, development, deployment time from one year to one day. That's the goal, okay? So the goal is to enable rapid design and deployment because a lot of times when these projects go overrun and over cost, it's not because something was not fast enough, or just the integration was problematic, okay? So, and uh, you know, the last thing software engineers want to do is uh, write code. They want to co cut and paste, right? So standardized abstraction so that with minimal reconfiguration, reprogramming, you can make this work, hopefully leading to proliferation. So that's the idea. Okay, so I want to show you uh, an, a movie. And then, oh, so, so here we have this, uh, these cars running around on this plywood sheet. We have these cameras up on the ceiling. Those are my only sensors here. And then we have these computers doing all this image processing. And uh, we have uh, computers doing all the, all the decision making from uh, <coughs> set point regulation to choice of set points to tracking to planning to replanning to scheduling to rescheduling, all the layers of decision making. And then we have these uh, computers, laptops that you can't see. 
uh, which uh, can either be an ad hoc wireless network or you can connect them by ethernet. And every one of these cars is a simple radio control car which is controlled by a dedicated radio frequency which you can think of as a virtual wire. Okay? So this is a completely closed loop system, closed over control, over vision, over decision making, over networking, everything. But what I want to talk about is what you can see in the picture, which is the software part of it. Okay? All right, but before I do that, let's look at one movie. And the closed loop vision system has two cameras, one for each side of the track. Each of those cameras' image is processed by two individual machines over here. That information is then transferred to a data server that is located over here, and it gives it to respective cars and their individual laptops. Each of these laptops controls an individual car. To demonstrate what happens when we lose the vision update, I'll just fake it by putting a cover over it. So that car can't be seen by the camera right now. He has an internal concept of where he is, which was wrong at that moment. These cars are just as happy to go backwards as forward. So this is an O.J. Simpson scenario. So this uh, is being driven by my student who wants to run away from these two cars that have to automatically follow in formation. And he's trying to confuse these two. So anyway, you get the idea, okay? Uh, now the way we build it is this, uh, we built it on top of uh, a communication stack, okay, by introducing another abstraction layer. So what are the abstraction layers? Well, the first abstraction is that we call everything on Earth a node, okay? So everything is a node. Second, the Phi Mac layer creates the abstraction of a link. Right? After that, you don't need to worry about how that link came about, whether it's Ethernet or infrared or wireless or whatever. And that's done through some physical medium, modulation, etc. The network layer, layer creates the abstraction of a graph. And after that, you don't need to worry about how to route from here to here. And then the, through some version of distributed Bellman 4 or something. And then the transport layer creates the abstraction of a pipe. So you drop a file here, it shows up here, reliably or unreliably, depending on TCP or UDP. And that's the, and so on. So if you think about it, what you're doing is you're building a more and more complex uh, abstractions as you go along, right? And I think that ultimately, you know, we are not going to be so much interested in the network. We're really going to be interested in what system is supported by the network, okay? So why not directly fa facilitate system building, okay? A system layer. And the system layer will be supported by or manufactured by real-time middleware, okay? <clears throat> uh, this is our real-time middleware, okay? And the application layer in our context here is just a simple component architecture. So we just have a whole bunch of components. So if you're interested in Kalman filtering, you write a few lines of code, that's a Kalman filter. You're interested in image processing, that's another few lines of code. Deadlock avoidance, another piece of code, and so on. And these components are managed by the middleware. It's doing all the housekeeping, okay? And these components may be executing on different nodes. It's a distributed system. And they may also be migrating, as I'll show you in a second. And all of that is taken care of by the system. Okay, <clears throat> so let me show you another example, a more useful example. So in this video, we're trying to illustrate the effects of our collision avoidance algorithm. So to show you how necessary it is to have a collision uh, avoidance algorithm, we're going to control the stationary car into a collision uh, trajectory with these two cars going in a nodal trajectory. So we move car 10 into position, and you'll see that cars 4 and 2 will continue unabated for a head-on collision. But things 
turn into a, a complete mess. And this was a motivation for developing a collision avoidance algorithm. So after some repairs, several months' work, and a restart, we're ready to show you the effects of our collision avoidance algorithm. So once again, we move car 10 into position, and you'll see cars 2 and 4 stop in response to him being in a car. The way the collision avoidance algorithm works is that each car tries to clear an area in front of him and to gain approval to move into it. So as we move car 10 around and into the area that the car requests approval for, you see they get denied and then stop. So each of the trajectories that the cars are following continue to evolve. So we can park car 10 in front of them, cause them to stop. But as soon as car 4, in this case, sees another, another way to get to his appropriate point in his trajectory, he's going to get that route cleared and start moving off in that direction. Okay, so you get the idea. So uh, I want to, sh now the, you know, the good thing about the architecture is that uh, more complex functionalities are very, are easily delivered. For example, component migration is an example. So, uh, so right now we're taking all the pixels from this uh, video camera and uh, shipping, I'm sorry, from this video camera and shipping it over to this computer. But when you communicate so many pixels, then you stress the data network, the wireless network, right? Now what you could say is why don't I just calculate the process the image in the cam com camera and only ship the latitude and longitude over to the computer. But then you may stress the computational capability of the processor in this video camera, right? So which should you do? Now that's exactly the kind of decision that I don't want to be bothered about because that depends on whether I have a Sony or an Icon camera or whether I have 822.11a or b or whatever. So it should be done automatically. So for example, if the Kalman filter, if there's a Kalman filter that's running on uh, here and uh, this link has excessive delay, then the Kalman filter should take its code, its computational state and migrate over and uh, start running there. So this is an example. Now we're gonna show how the middleware can migrate a component from one computing node to another. In order to demonstrate this, we first have the car just traveling a simple oval trajectory and we're going to unplug the network card to show you what happens when he loses network connectivity. So we'll unplug now. And he stops. He's not receiving the updates he needs, so he stops. Now, the system is robust to this sort of failure. Plugging him back in, he will recover. It takes a moment for the system to detect that the, that the pieces have come back up. His point in the trajectory has continued to move, therefore he's recovering. And now he's recovered his position. Now we're back to where we were before. In order to show the migration, we will now migrate the process from the laptop on the right to the laptop on the left. Now, of course there's nothing to see, which is the beauty of it, but now to show you that that has happened, we're going to unplug the network card again, the network connection again. And now it has no input. So we have effectively migrated the component from one computing node to another in real time with no apparent impact to the control of the car at all. So it's like changing a car while you're driving it, an engine of a car or something. Okay, so, uh, but that doesn't impress my control colleagues, so this is a more unstable system. I want to demonstrate the universe controller migration capability with real time performance. Now I'm going to turn on the power of the motor of the inverted pendulum. A controller which controls the inverted pendulum is running on the front computer. At the rear computer, the component which mediates the interaction between the controller and the inverted pendulum is running. So the inverted pendulum is being controlled by a remote controller. To show that the inverted pendulum is controlled over the network, and it's from there, the natural from the controller. So the inverted pendulum allows it to stabilize the control inputs, and the remote controller allows it to network connection. 
now we are back to the previous situation. At this time, I migrate the controller from the front computer to the rear computer. Now, the controller is migrating, but we cannot see any change in the equipment pendulum. To see if the controller is migrating correctly, I'll disconnect the network connection again. This time, the equipment pendulum is still being controlled. So we have migrated the controller from one computer to another at one time without sacrificing the stability of the equipment pendulum. So, so, so basically, you know, this is an unstable system. And we want to control the cyber-physical systems uh, reliably, guaranteeably, etc., uh, in real time, okay? uh, while doing all these operations at the network layer. Okay, uh, I want to wrap up. I have like five minutes, four minutes. <laughs> uh, so very quickly, uh, provably correct behavior. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, there's a whole bunch of cars here, and they're all uh, starting at home in their garage, and they're trying to go to office. And uh, you cannot see it, but there's a whole bunch of streets, traffic lights, and uh, these cars uh, politely or impolitely wait for each other to cross, okay? So that's the, that's the kind of application. Okay. Okay, now, the, this, in order to prove that this system is provably correct, right, uh, what, uh, what we want to show, so here's a theorem. This is a handcrafted theorem, okay? Connecting, it's, it's, it's you know, a lot of theories are uh, slotted at one particular discipline, so communication theory or control theory, stability or something, but this is uh, uh, transcending all these fields. So. Uh, so, the, uh, so this is a directed graph model of a traffic light, a mutual exclusion model, okay, of a traffic light. If you're going this way, you shouldn't go this way. Uh, this is a balls and bin model of the streets, which guarantees that you don't get deadlock. When everybody in Manhattan wants to make a right turn around a block and it's congested, then it's deadlock, right? You want to make sure that you don't get into such situations. You need proofs. And uh, this is a physical model of the world, road widths, angles, etc. Uh, there's a kinematic or a dynamic model of the car. There's a real-time renewal tasks. You have to keep updating the vision of each car, otherwise it runs off the road. So you have to, get, you have to uh, it's a renewal uh, tasks here. And then the theorem is that when these conditions are satisfied, then everything is fine in the sense that there are no collisions. That is uh, safety, that nobody, no two cars collide and nobody runs off the road. And you don't get any gridlock, okay? But this is a handcrafted theorem. Now, as we build more and more complicated systems like air traffic control, how can we completely automate this? And the biggest uh, challenge here is complexity, you know, decidability and uh, doubly exponential complexity and so on. So the whole idea is we need to find uh, loopholes through which uh, we can uh, thread our, uh, the kind of questions that we are interested in, okay? That's the challenge. Okay, now I, this is my last uh, uh, slide, which is a kind of, uh, morality play, if you will, okay? There's a larger problem. So this uh, is an example, uh, so, so this is an example of the kind of intersection in a small town like Champaign or College Station where I am now, and these, this traffic light is totally useless because there's no traffic, okay? And it's night, etc. So what we want to do is get rid of the traffic light. Cars negotiate the intersection via packet exchanges, thereby reducing fuel consumption, reduce delay, greater safety, et cetera, okay? Uh, so this, and then uh, by the Toyota funded us for this. They were not at all interested in this application, but I said that's all I'm gonna work on. So this uh, is not a simulation, it's a provably, it's the execution of a provably correct algorithm. Okay, I'm not sure you'd want to sit on this, in this car because nobody waits for anybody. The small changes and it's probably safe. You may get a heart attack, but, but it is safe, okay? <laughs> all right, so great, okay? So wonderful application, we're all very, very happy. But let's think about it. 
So this is an interesting uh, graph here, okay. Uh, what it shows is every dot here is some community in the world, okay. Uh, the x-axis is the income level, the GDP per capita. So these are poor countries, these are rich countries. So these are some poor countries, Tokyo, Los Angeles are somewhere here. Some villages are somewhere here and, okay. On the y-axis is the average amount of time that people in that community commute to work, take to commute to work, okay. And what you see is that more or less it's about one hour. So human beings somehow have they decided uh, in their evolution that one hour per day is the right time to walk to work or go on horseback to work or drive in a freeway in Los Angeles to work or whatever, right? And depending on the technology, they will move far away. <laughs> so you have highways in Los Angeles, people live 50 miles away. You have nothing, then they will live next door, right? But one hour is the invariant. So if that is the human invariant, and you make it easier to negotiate these uh, traffic lights faster, what, what, will, what will be the reaction? Urban sprawl, right? People will live further away because one hour is what they're willing to put up with. So therefore, when you think about this problem holistically, this solution is maybe totally useless, okay? Maybe you should think of congestion pricing or maybe reward for taking, for walking to work or something. So the point is that when we, as we, uh, as we uh, get this technology to build all these sophisticated systems, sensing, actuation, communication, etc., cetera, uh, it's not just technological geekiness that's important. Somehow we need to think of what is the real problem that we want to solve. So that's a question, <laughs> okay? And I'll stop there, thank you. Okay. Do we have time for questions? Seems like lots of problems. So this question was uh, more on the last few slides. Sure, there's a completely automated system that you can verify the safety of. So at least we look at the way autonomous cars and uh, the, you know, the evolution there is going. Seems like at least for a certain amount of time, they have to coexist with human-driven cars. So there's a human in the loop who's probably not going to obey the mathematical models that we have. So these cars must not only be capable of working when there's a completely rational agent, but also when there's chaotic systems in place. So that's one part. And the other part is the kinds of uh, things that you showed where the car can't be seen by the camera, etc. I would say those are the easy problems. The hard problems are when the car camera can see the car, but it reports a different position, or it completely there's a malicious person who's taken over this. So how how would these systems work in the presence of a chaotic agents and b security violations? Okay, so so uh, the two answers are two different uh, issues. The first is you're asking if the car can be seen or is reported somewhere. So there are two types of issues, okay? What is the architecture of the infrastructure and what's the architecture of the application? So what I've talked about here is the architecture of the abstraction layers that can support any application, whether it is uh, driving a car that can be seen or is invisible or misreported, that's the details of the application. But all these applications will require components and uh, and communication and real time interactions and so on. So I'm suggested an architecture to support any application building. Now in the application, you could have different error correction capabilities or redundancy or something. That's, that's the application architecture, also very, very important. In fact, in the case of collision avoidance, the application architecture is an interesting problem. I didn't talk about it, but for example, collision avoidance should be an ever present functionality that's there whether you're driving to school to drop your kids off or you're going to the grocery store or drag racing or whatever, right? I mean, collision avoidance should be there all the time. So how do you build software so that, you know, whenever you work on software, it's never the end of the story, right? 
There's always some other evolution. Somebody's at, the moment you finish one thing, somebody will add another feature. They're always tinkering with code. That's why every day I get a, every time I open up my Word, I get an update in you know, a Microsoft Word, every time. I can't do any work, <laughs> so it's just updating all the time. So, so the point is that uh, uh, how would you design that thing so that it remains safe against future improvements? There are many interesting questions about the application architecture. Also, people ask, is it distributed? Is it uh, centralized? In this case, it's regional. So these are all uh, questions at the application level. I focus mostly on the infrastructure level, though there are interesting questions and to think, talk about that. Second question you asked is, the first question you asked is very, very uh, correct. So it turns out that in many of these technologies, we have a perfect solution right now, which is everybody driving by looking at the road. And we'll also have a perfect solution 100 years later when everything is automated. The most important question is one of transition. How do you go from here to there? So when you build an air traffic, automated air traffic control system, we can work out the algorithms for the automated thing but we also have a human voice driven system now which is working. How do you go through this intermediate phase where the percentage of deployment keeps increasing and you want a solution that works as this percentage keeps increasing, it's a big challenge, okay? And in fact, that's the, one of the biggest challenges for acceptance of any technology. You're absolutely right, okay? Uh, I don't have uh, anything to say on that, okay? All right. So, um, part of this is, um, the, the, so you, you discussed the architectural challenges and so on, right? But uh, some of these uh, planning algorithms and so on, so is the scaling behavior of those primarily controllable through localization or uh, things like that? As in, if I increase the number of cars, if I had to plan for Manhattan, then the density of cars is pretty high. Mm -hmm. low, is that yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, I talked about scaling of very simple problems like average temperature and so on. But when you're trying to form a regional map or just enough of a local map so you know whom to not collide with, I mean, these are questions that you have to study. What is the amount of messages you need? Then you need to know who's within half a kilometer of you and so on. Yeah. Uh, so in a sense, there's... Uh, yeah, there, there are many... Lots, there's still lots yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't talk about the the scaling of these distributed system, control system applications. I didn't talk about that. I think there are many important questions. So maybe this is a more philosophic question. In your first slide, or first few slides, you showed that you know, these areas of control, communication, computing evolved separate. I mean, they started off together, but then they took their own separate paths, and okay. now they're coming together. Right? But one of the challenges, at least in the computing side and some the communication control side, is the language spoken is very different, not just in terms of terms, but in terms of the mathematics, right? Like in computing, it's mostly discrete math, it's log, you know, first order logic and so on, whereas in here it's more continuous math, calculus. And at least for um, those who are working in the computing area, it seems like a huge bridge to cross to understand how these physical systems work so that we can abstract them. So what do you think should happen for that? Is it, is it that we should be educating uh, future engineers on both sides of the spectrum, or is there going to be like a unified way of thinking about these systems? So I'm yeah. just... So, so actually, you're absolutely right. You know, a good example is uh, the use of the word functional and non-functional. So to a electrical engineer, the control system is a functional part, and all this middleware is non-functional. Whereas to the computer scientist, all the middleware is a function, all this control system is just uh, it's minor annoyance, okay? It's a, it's a non, it's the non-functional part, right? Okay, so the words are exactly interchanged in the two communities. But more broadly, I mean, uh, vocabulary is what divides us, <laughs> you know, terminology. So I once took uh, a course offered by the veterinary school about teaching biology to engineers, and the name of this course is the, the language of medicine. And in fact, the whole thing is language because the notion, vector, matrix, they mean completely different things to a doctor than to, to you and me, okay? So, yeah, so I think uh, the language separates us. Now, this is a question of, uh, uh, you know, this challenge of, uh, you know, knowledge is increasing exponentially. There were topics, there are topics now that didn't exist 25 years ago. 
Yet the curriculum, when I studied engineering, it was five years, now it's four years. So time has decreased, but yet there's more and more stuff that you need to pack in. How are you going to do it? Okay. This is a permanent problem because it's going to keep on increasing. There's no stop to it, right? Time is fixed, our human lifespan is fixed. So I think ultimately, if you ask me for a very, very futuristic question, I can teach you all the facts. I can teach you how to learn. So maybe ultimately, you know, this could be a little uh, speculative, maybe down the road what we'll say is, hey, I want to teach you how to learn different subjects. For example, this is the way you, there are subjects which, uh, which uh, are clustered in different ways. So mathematics is different from experimental physics, is different from uh, software engineering, right? So I'll say, okay, there are three examples of subjects, and I'm going to show you how to approach each of these things and learn enough and so on. So we may need to recognize stylistic differences between areas. We may need to teach uh, students how to, uh, how to categorize, uh, how to understand taxonomy and how to, so, so, so we may, it's meta learning or meta something, you know? So that may be what we need to do uh, in the long haul. In the short haul, I think that uh, all of us, uh, you know, we, we failed uh, miserably in some ways. I'll give you an example. So one month I forgot to pay the unlimited message option on my daughter's uh, iPhone. And I got an $800 bill. Okay. And I calculated that she was sending or receiving a message like every 30 seconds uh, nonstop for a month, 24 hours a day. And she's not a bad student. She's an excellent student. But this is what the kids' lives are. Okay. So now we people, on the other hand, write books as if we can go to an island and lie down in the sun and read this thousand page book, you know, from cover to cover and be totally engrossed. Nobody I know has read a book. No undergraduate student I know has ever read a book, any book from cover to cover, okay? So we have this, I mean, we're just fooling ourselves, right? Uh, so I think that we need to do course compression. Okay, we are uh, populating our books with all kinds of irrelevant things. We need to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff, extract the principles. I, I don't see why you can't, why you need 1,000 pages to teach optimization. Why can't it be done in 20 pages? You know? So, so there's a, we need to exercise more discipline, uh, course compaction. We need to reorganize curricula, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. And the challenges are different at the undergraduate and the graduate level. At the, undergra at, the, uh, at the undergraduate level, you do want to convey breadth, right? Uh, but there are many challenges. At the graduate level, you also want to convey depth. You know, you need to go deep down in one thing, but be aware of other things. Uh, yeah, but by and large, I think that we have, if uh, our impact of our research on the undergraduate curriculum, in one sense, has been minimal. In another sense, it's been extraordinary, in the sense that no matter what any uh, knowledge is there in this world, something new is discovered, within a few years it appears in a textbook. So in that sense, we capture all the knowledge, okay? Fantastically. So this whole book publishing enterprise that academics by and large do is phenomenally successful. Phenomenally. There's no fact known anywhere in the world which is not in a textbook. But on the other hand, it's in a way that is uh, too leisurely, okay? So, so I think there are many challenges. Yeah. Sort of quick questions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a log of log n type convergence for the max. Does that come from extreme value theory, where the max of a bunch of random variables is e to the e to the x? No, no, no. This is just for a bounded thing. Even if the binary is zero, one, it's that. Yeah, it's not. It's not a probabilistic thing uh, at it all. It's just. It's just worst case. No, no, no. It's just. It's just a, a compression. <laughs> compression of sequences. That's all. Yeah, as you fill in, you have a sequence with some ones. Let's say your temperature is a binary, zero, one. One is a max. If anybody has a one, you're done. So if you're in a room, you announce a set of temperatures at which you have a one, and you can compress that list very efficiently. And somebody hearing it can fill in the gaps, compress it, and so on. And, and the whole thing uh, with block coding can be done in exponential speed up here. There are no further questions, but thank, thank you. you.